American was was like the thing, and so uh, they they also adopted the idea of American religious freedom. So they have you know the American expression rush hour. In Japanese, they'll be speaking long, and then they'll say rush hour, but but, but they call it the rush hour of the kami, K A M I kami. You know means their gods, their deities, as in kamikaze. Remember the kamikaze pilots? Divine wind, the kami. In other words, they're, they're, they're committing suicide for the gods. Literally. Well, anyway, the rush hour of the kami. So after World War II, MacArthur said to the emperor, he said, you must have a constitution, and in the constitution you have freedom of religion. So, boy, they went crazy. And they all these religions just popped up. And one of the one of the biggest is very popular here in Dallas, known as uh, Nishirin Shoshu or Sokagakai. So you can go this morning up to Midway and there's a big Buddhist center there and they'll be meeting and uh, they'll be they're having their Baptist, no, excuse me, Baptist, oh boy. <laughs> it's, it's time to quit, right? <laughs> Buddhist Baptist, but anyway, they're have, having their Japanese Buddhism uh, style. We're really quite impressive, by the way, if you've never been. Now, um, as so often happens with the series I do, I never get to what I'm supposed to talk about, which is, which is beer and wine, and, and that's the same as going to happen today, because before I get to beer and wine, I have to do sodas and soft drinks and all of that, all right? So we, I want to apologize to you if you were all excited about hearing about beer and wine. I'm very interested in those topics, and I have a lot to say, but, but I'll have to maybe do that another time. Uh, but anyway, I wanted, first of all, to talk about how soft drinks came into existence. The, the big innovation, this happened way back in the middle of the 18th century, was to put carbonated water and mix it with a, a drink of some kind. It could be a fruit drink, uh, but in most cases it was, it was a drink. And this carbonation, was believed very helpful. Remember, all sodas, all, um, as, as they say in the Midwest, <coughs> soda pop, all uh, drinks of carbonation were considered medicine. And uh, so all of, of the big three, um, Dr. Pepper, Coke, Pepsi, 7-Up, all these were medicine from the very beginning. In fact, everything I've talked about in this series, at one time or another, has been considered medicine, right? The pepper and the spices and the chocolate and the coffee and all of it, right? Now, there was a, um, there was a, a man named Jacob Schwepp. You've heard of Schwepp's, yeah. Well, Jacob Schwepp was a Swiss guy who was, is considered the founder of the soft drink industry. And uh, he, in 1790, he had an opportunity to, to take his carbonation drink to England. And uh, he did, but then the Napoleonic Wars prevented him from returning to Switzerland, so he ended up spending his life in England, Schweppes. And of course, the number one Schweppes drink was ginger ale. Mm -hmm. And I would say probably still is today. Now, uh, soft drinks were very, very popular starting in the 1870s because of the temperance movement. So the idea was, before that time, they're just strictly medicine. After that time, they're medicine and a drink that you drink instead of drinking beer, liquor, wine, or whatever. And, um, and so that's, that's how the thing evolved. Now, um, in the meantime, there's another movement going on, and which of these eventually kind of come together, and that is the, the mineral water craze. Now, the, the place that kind of made mineral waters um, very well known was in Sarasota Springs, New York. Now, Sarasota Springs in the 18, early 1800s was already a resort, and people would go there for um, the waters, right? 
And uh, you know, in Europe, there are many of these places. Uh, and in the United States, eventually, there are many places where people go. Uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas comes to mind. So, so important that they, in Hot Springs, they actually have a national park. Uh, the smallest national park in America, a <laughs> very small thing. I had an experience there one time. I wanted to go through one of these famous bathhouses they had in Hot Springs that they used as a kind of, most of them are closed now, but they used, you know, to show. So they had it cranked up, you know, with, it was kind of, you know, like a big sauna, I think is the best way to describe it. So I went in there, it was a hot day, it was about 100 degrees in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Ooh, brutal. I went in there and, you know, it was very, very hot and humid. And we were in there for about half an hour, and you know, everybody was just drenched in sweat and so on. And I came out, opened the door, walked out, and it felt like I was walking into a refrigerator. <laughs> and, and so I thought, my God, this cold front has come through. <laughs> and, but the temperature hadn't changed outside, is what had changed, is I had been inside at 140 and, uh, and walked out. It's, 100 degrees seemed like 70 degrees. <laughs> It's all, it's all relative. Well, anyway, there was, a, there was a man in Sarasota Springs at this resort. One day, a lady would complain that the potatoes were cut too thick. They made American fries, and they were cut too thick, and she sent it back. So this guy named George Crum, there at the Moon Lake Lodge, he said, I'll get her. So he... He just, he sliced them as thin as he could possibly slice them and fried them up and uh, sent them out. And immediately came back, more, more, those are wonderful. George Crum had invest and just invented potato chips. And uh, anyway, uh, so two things came out of Sarasota Springs, mineral water and potato chips. Now I want to give you a term that I learned about, if I can spell it. Neuro, and this second word is a very hard word for A S T H, A S T H E N I A. Neuro asthenia. Now, this is a medical condition. It was called Neuroasthenia Americana. In other words, this is a disease Americans, only Americans had in the 1840s. Uh, it was where you have um, this pandemic all over the country of people having fatigue, anxiety, insomnia, and aches and pains. Sounds like the flu, right? And uh, so they were all these people that were had claimed to have cure for this disease. Now the word neuro, neuro is kind of giving you a hint, we're dealing with a, a psychological condition here, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, this became popular and everybody had, they started selling uh, Sarasota Springs water and uh, it went on the market and uh, there was uh, every place in the country where there was some kind of mineral water became popular. In Texas, the, the, there was a, a group that sold crazy water crystals, crazy water crystals. And uh, crazy water crystals were from what town? Mineral Wells. Mineral Wells, yes. Mineral Wells wouldn't be on the map uh, except for those, uh, the, the mineral uh, ten, content of the water there. Well, anyway, they would take the water and they would just evaporate H2O out, and what they left, they'd scrape up and put in pill form and sell it all over the country. In 1932, NBC radio had a national broadcast from Mineral Wells promoting uh, the uh, value of these crazy crystal, crazy water crystals, and they had their own uh, musical group called the Crazy Medical Gang, and uh, you know, typical of that kind of thing in the 1930s. Well, anyway, so you have mineral waters, and then you have carbonated water. Now, these all come together in what becomes known as the soda fountain. And so the first soda fountain 
in the early uh, 1800s was built Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And eventually these soda fountains become very elaborate and extensive. But again, the soda fountain's primary purpose was to, to, to mix up drinks that were medicine that the pharmacist or the doctor had told you is going to take care of that stomach ache, that migraine headache, uh, that abscess tooth, you know, whatever. And uh, so this is, of course, um, one of the things that, that becomes huge, the, the whole business of the soda fountain, because it's the place you go then to get these concoctions, but also at the same time, you, they, would, they started serving ice cream, and uh, ultimately uh, they served, uh, the, the story of course of the ice cream sundae is amazing, because they served, um, it was illegal to serve soda on Sundays. Yeah. They considered soda water to be too effervescent. In other words, too exciting. <laughs> 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 In other words, if, wow, it, if it tastes good, if it if it's uh, if it tastes good, if it if it makes you feel good, then it has to be bad, right? Yeah. So there were many cities in America that outlawed it. So this the what they came up with was they could still serve ice cream. So they served ice cream, put chocolate on it, some bananas and some cherries and so on, and created a Sunday. They only served on Sunday, which is called Sunday. And ultimately the spelling changed to, uh, to S-U-N-D-A-E, Sunday, and uh, became one of the most popular things. What they served that was, was not allowed on Sundays, is what we call a float. Soda water with ice cream in it. And I would say over time, the carbonation kind of replaced the natural mineral waters. Now you can still buy mineral waters to this day, and that's essentially when you buy this expensive Swiss brand called uh, Perrier. Uh, yeah, Perrier. Perrier is French or Swiss? French. 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 Well anyway, there is this, uh, we talked last time about Nestle's. Nestle's, this is amazing. Nestle's, the company, has monopolized almost all the mineral water and all the water companies. They bought them all up. So you buy a Rosarka, right? From Arkansas? Who owns it? Nestle's. And uh, they just go on and on. Evian and Perrier, all, these are all owned by Nestle. Nestle has been, shall we say, has a, a cornered the market on water. I mean, think about that a minute. Cornered yeah, the market really. on water. Yeah, so anyway, let me briefly, and then we got to quit, to mention to you, of course, the most famous of the sodas, and that is, uh, first, the first one that we all know well is Dr. Pepper. Now, I won't go into Dr. Pepper because some of you already know, Dr. Pepper wasn't the first soft drink. That actually came out in 1871, uh, the Lemon, lemon Superior Ginger Ale. Ginger Ale has been, is maybe the oldest of the soft drinks. And, uh, but anyway, down in Waco, Charles Elderton, or Alderton, uh, he, he took this idea of a drink to his friend Wade Morrison at the corner drugstore and, uh, in Waco. And so Morrison liked it, and Morrison uh, eventually uh, you know, bought the formula. And uh, Alderton uh, then uh, never, well, he... Alton didn't die not long after that, but, but uh, Morrison is the one who had the rights to it. And it became, and, and then eventually it becomes, you know, one of the most famous drinks. First in Texas, and then now around the world. You can buy <clears throat> Dr. Pepper many, many places. But um, strangely enough, uh, this idea that Dr. Pepper, <clears throat> Uh, who Dr. Pepper is named after is a great controversy. The, the company really basically doesn't get into it, but there were actually two Dr. Peppers that were in uh, Alderton's life, and uh, I'm, excuse me, Morrison's life, because Morrison, who took over the, it was basically given to him, uh, this, this formula, uh, he named it Dr. Pepper. But there were two, he was from Virginia, there were two Dr. Peppers in 
Virginia that he knew and, and something about his daughter and all of this stuff. Nobody knows for sure how that came out. By the way, what other famous drink was invented in Waco in 1937? You won't know this, so I'll tell you. Big Red. <laughs> now, let me see if I can squeeze in Coca-Cola here. Now, Coca-Cola, of course, came out the next year, 1886. Frank Pemberton, pharmacist, came up with French wine cola. And uh, he, it was first served in Jacob's Pharmacy that had a soda fountain and uh, the big one, beautiful one, and uh, became immediately became popular. So Pemberton, Frank Robinson, and a man named Doe formed a company to sell this French wine cola uh, as a medicine in the pharmacy, and, uh, and, and then as a patent medicine, essentially. Robinson, uh, then one of the owners, came up with the idea of the word Coca-Cola, because it was a combination of the coca leaf extract and cola. And Pemberton, uh, when Pemberton uh, was very ill, uh, two years later, he sold two-thirds of Coca-Cola for a loan of $1,200 uh, to two of his friends, and he dies. And uh, a man named uh, Chandler comes along, and nobody wanted this, basically, this patent medicine, so he bought the whole thing, and it was Chandler. They turned Coca-Cola, of course, to the famous company that it's become. Interestingly enough, <laughs> it had cocaine in it, right? But in 1902, the feds uh, seized Coca-Cola shipments because it had caffeine in it. <laughs> <laughs> and they thought caffeine was a dangerous drug. And of course, then uh, they had, in 1904, the federal the feds required them to take out, uh, uh, by then, uh, this, this idea that it had a, a coca leaf extract. By the way, they took out the extract, uh, but they put it back in when they figured out a formula, which they did pretty quickly, to take the cocaine out of it. So it still has coca leaf extract in it. Not, not much, of course, but they, that's why they can still call it Coca-Cola. And uh, anyway, uh, 1931, the Coca-Cola people hired a man named uh, Sundblom, a Swedish guy, who, who, who came up as an artist, and he came up with a design for the elf and for the Santa. Both of those faces were his face. So the famous Santa, Coca-Cola Santa, was this man named Sunberg. Anyway, uh, Coca-Cola, I have two more things, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, during, during World War uh, II, Coca-Cola company, Chandler, uh, committed to the idea that every soldier in the world would be able to buy Coca-Cola for five cents. Now, it had, so Coca-Cola had sold for five, the 6.5 ounce, the one I grew up on, and the one many of you remember, and they still have a, a, what we call the small bottle today, that, that sold for six cents. It did not change for 73 years. From 1886, from the beginning, until 1959, a bottle of Coke sold for five cents. 19... Uh, 59. So that's, you know, how I remember. Pe you see, Pepsi, the only reason Pepsi ever took off is because Pepsi came out with essentially the same formula for five cents, but it was a 12-ounce bottle, twice as big. And Pepsi took off like a rocket ship. And uh, so anyway, during the war, Chandler said, everyone, every soldier will have Coca-Cola. And so they built... You can imagine the cost of doing this. 69 plants around the world, primarily in Europe theater and in Southeast Asia, or in Asia, the Asian theater. 69 plants, just incredible cost to Coca-Cola. But that idea that, that they would immediately have, they, they uh, 
uh, did something like uh, 69 billion uh, bottles of Coke during the war, from 41 to 45. This is stunning numbers, right? And so here's what we're leaving out today. We're not, we're not going to get to anything about uh, Budweiser. We're not going to talk anything about about uh, Morgan David Wine or any of that stuff. So I'll just have to figure out a way to bring it back yeah. in. Yeah. But anyway, in May I'm going to do the program Made in America. Now this is going to be a very whimsical kind of presentation. I will talk about people like Henry Ford and his his great innovation. Basically, it's, it's going to talk about innovative, either innovative individuals or innovative movements in America. So, uh, some of them religious, some of them uh, commercial, capitalistic, and so forth. But uh, it ought to be a pretty good program. So I'll do that in this room uh, in the, for three uh, I think Tuesdays in 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 yeah. May. So in the evening. Yeah, in the evening. Yeah, it's probably about yeah, seven. Work. You work in the booths at the same time. In the who? The uh, booths. Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. I suppose because we could talk about American uh, <laughs> yeah. beer and American wine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Why not? Okay. Okay, you left us hanging because you said there were three things that started. In oh, what was my the boy. Third one? There's. There's a student. There, you, when you have a student like this, it's just great, except when you make a mistake. And you know, right. Yeah, so I forgot to tell you the third. Does anybody know the, the, this is in Dallas, downtown Dallas? 1917, Adolphus Hotel. The French, the French Room, the great service organization, the Lions Club, was created. Oh my yeah, of all the service organizations, Lions is one of the most famous, and it's worldwide, and started in the Adolphus Hotel by a bunch of uh, men from uh, Dallas who wanted to do do some good, and they sure have. Right? So thank you all for coming. Thank you.